I've been invited today on this webcast to talk with Joe Duffy because apparently literally everyone else said no and he really had to scrape the bottom of the barrel. Joe, thanks for inviting me here. I'm certain you'll regret it by the end of this recording. So who are you and what does a Pulumi do? Yeah, thanks, Corey. I appreciate you doing it, even if I did have to scrape the bottom of the barrel. I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so my name is Joe, um, founder of a company called Pulumi uh, and an open source project. I think that's probably the most interesting part here. Um, and Pulumi is an infrastructure as code uh, platform that allows you to provision cloud infrastructure using your favorite languages. So whether that's Python or JavaScript or C Sharp or Go, uh, much like many other infrastructure as code tools, you basically you know, declare what infrastructure you'd like, and then the Pulumi engine goes and makes it happen. And we support lots of different clouds, AWS, Azure, GCP, Kubernetes, and about three dozen others. So great for infrastructure teams, great for developers too. And interestingly, you're apparently having a bit of a launch of a new version that comes out, which I'm sure is interesting and useful to someone out there. But the reason I'm here is mostly to give you grief about what appears to be a platypus as your mascot. Indeed. In fact, we're taking the platypus to a whole nother level as part of this launch. So it would seem historically the the historically the platypus mascot that you had was an 8 bit rendered image which was great and all. Now that I see the thing in full relief, I understand why there was only an 8-bit image of him because he looks sad and depressed and awful. And if we look at his face, we understand that he knows that too. Hmm. I have to disagree there. I mean, look at this guy. He's about to take off, you know, after running Pulumi up, he's going to be soaring through the air, happy, going to new heights that he's never been to before. But he's not there yet. Look at him. He looks like he's the mascot for social distancing. We're just getting started, day one. That's the look of someone in the middle of being broken up with by their own parents. It just, it's a strange, sad looking platypus. It's actually funny how we end up with a platypus. Um, we actually had a friend of the of family basically sketch out a platypus and that's what led to the 8-bit. Uh, and we kind of didn't really use the platypus much in our original marketing. Uh, but then the team, it was like a team mutiny. The team loved the platypus so much, they started creating mugs and posters and it's like literally a six foot wide platypus on the wall at the office. And so we decided to run with it and have a little bit of fun for the 2.0 release. Yeah, I think it's clear looking at the two of the platypuses side by side that only one of them would be the main character in a movie about his own life. But I'll let viewers decide which one is which. Sounds, sounds like a plan. Yes, but enough of talking about your boneless splatipus that we've got at the moment. Let's talk a little bit more about the reason people are actually looking to this rather than watching me trade cheap shots with you about logos. What is Pulumi? Yeah, so Pulumi, you know, really is that open source infrastructure as code platform. You know, we started Pulumi, um, you know, launched the open source about a year and a half ago, uh, a little bit longer than that. And, you know, good community is growing, has been growing significantly since then. We're seeing a lot of success in teams that really want to both their infrastructure teams to have sort of a huge step up, but then also kind of help their developers do more cloud infrastructure as part of their application architecture. We're finding increasingly, you know, especially with new serverless capabilities, you know, uh, Redshift and Aurora, a lot of the hosted services, really, the closer you can bring that to the application development lifecycle, the more the applications can actually use them in a first class way, rather than having, you know, lambdas sort of configured with yaml over there and then you know you write your javascript over here you can just stay within the confines of of your favorite language um and so the 2.0 release is really taking that same original vision of Pulumi and taking it you know a lot further to tackle some new challenges especially around things like policies as code uh testing your infrastructure you know we're adding a lot of new features as part of this release since i started my career as a systems administrator i'm grumpy and skeptical about anything that vaguely looks new and so I've started to pay more attention to Pulumi in the past few months because there's been a point that's been reached where, oh, an infrastructure is code answer. Great. Oh, good. I've never seen one of those before. Tell me another one. But now I'm starting to see that there's a key indicator that is popping up. Namely, I'll talk about something I'm working on and some rando will respond with, have you tried Pulumi? Well, this, this things like that happen all the time. The key distinction here is that said rando doesn't work for Pulumi. This is a member of the community advocating for it, which means, OK, this is not something that is just a one company project anymore. There really is a community. So it's time for me to dive in and start taking a deeper look. Yeah, that's great to hear. I mean, honestly, last year was huge, a huge year. I mean, we're still new, right? We started a year and a half ago, but 
you know, last year I actually personally went to about a dozen DevOps days conferences uh, just to really connect with infrastructure and operations practitioners and and talk to folks. And honestly, the reception exceeded my expectations. You know, it, because we started with a programming language, it's obvious that developers would like it, right? Because they get to use their existing toolkit, and it's not just language; it's their editors, their test frameworks. What I didn't expect is that it would resonate so much with folks in the DevOps community, where actually a lot of folks have had experience with Ruby, thanks to Chef Puppet, you know, Python with SaltStack and Ansible and and uh, Bodo scripting. So actually, and that's why we're all so angry all the time, right? <laughs> right, but the, like we've kind of almost taken a step backwards in in a sense because we used to use these languages and. You know, there's some challenges that we ran into, but then we kind of reverted all the way back to YAML and, and domain specific languages, which now we're sort of recreating the wheel there. And so actually just using a language and the, the key is that we're taking languages, but we're actually still declarative infrastructures code at the heart of the system. And that's a really key distinction. So when you say infrastructure as code, that's meant an awful lot of things at different times. When we look historically back at the things you just mentioned, uh, Puppet, where I was a corporate trainer, SaltStack, which I wrote part of, Chef, Ansible, etc., they all were aimed more or less at provisioning systems once they were spun up. Build a box, we care not how, then go ahead and build something on top of that, and we can provision those things with our tooling. You're talking almost a step beyond that, if I'm not mistaken, where it's you're going to help provision the instance or the box. In other words, now that we're in a time of cloud, you're integrating with that cloud provider and moving beyond just what's inside of the instance or the container and now out to actually provisioning those resources natively. That's ex exactly right. Um, so, you know, if you want an EKS cluster, you know, how, how, how do you ensure that you've configured the, the VPC that the EKS cluster is going to live in, make sure all the public private subnets are set up correctly, uh, ancillary services, like if you're gonna use Route 53 for your DNS, you know, instead of having your own sort of DNS controller inside your EKS cluster, CloudWatch, you wanna set up some metrics and dashboards and alerts. Maybe you've got some hosted data stores because frankly, you'd be, you know, a glutton for pain if you really wanna manage a persistent data store versus just using, you know, within your cluster versus just using RDS. And so the idea that you can really declare all of this infrastructure using a flexible language, so, you know, if you, if you want to say, hey, for each availability zone in this region, do something, you can do that. You've got the full you know, power of a language um, and that. But, it, but it's still infrastructure as code. So now you, you set up that blueprint and now you say, OK, I'm going to set up my test version of this infrastructure. Uh, maybe I'm going to stand up a few production you know, clusters. Maybe I'm going to put one in Europe and it's going to be slightly different because it's GDPR or something, you know, requires a slightly different infrastructure and so we really allow you to kind of like define that infrastructure and then stand it up anywhere you've got to provision it. The way that I view the evolution of spinning up cloud resources in AWS, for example, I view there being four stages of maturity. Uh, stage one, where you click around in the console. Uh, stage two, where you're using cloud formation, because that's what they were told we're supposed to do. And it's awful, but we use it anyway. Stage three, people evolve beyond that into Terraform or one of its competitors in that space. And stage four, uh, the ultimate stage where you've ascended, and that's where you're using the AWS console and lying to people about it. So on those four stages, where do you tend to see this being the natural point of adoption? Yeah, it tends to be in that shift to re realizing you need an automated tool for provisioning, realizing you, you actually do want to, you know, maybe you've pointed and clicked, and but you accidentally deleted something, or may, maybe you've been doing this for a while, and now you have to scale up your infrastructure, and you realize, okay, I, I need some rigorous way of managing my infrastructure. And usually it's at some level of complexity uh, as well. Um, like, you know, may, maybe you can get by with little scripts, you know, when you're just doing, you know, a few VMs and a, a network, but now, now you throw in lots of hosted services, which frankly, AWS makes it really easy to do, because you've got, you know, I think, I don't know if we're over 200 different services in AWS, but if not, we're certainly close. And there's a lot of fine grained pieces to manage. And for that code is really, really great. The other transition is really, we see developers increasingly having to do infrastructure as part of their job. You know, it, like if you're a startup today starting and you're building your business on AWS or, or Azure or another cloud, you don't wanna say, oh, I've got my infrastructure team over there and my developers over there. And oh, you guys interact with ticketing in between or something. You want the team to be able to work together uh, at a high velocity. And, and that's the other transition where we see this is a great you know, tool. 
to review, this is not just an AWS specific tool. This works with a variety of excellent leading infrastructure providers and a handful of crappy ones too, correct? Yes, so definitely we support uh, lots of different cloud providers, uh, all the major ones. Um, as you see here, you know, we've got Kubernetes support as well in a, in a first class way. So you can really, you know, the funny thing is, you know, standing up an EKS cluster as my example earlier actually requires doing a lot of AWS stuff, a lot of, you know, Kubernetes stuff. And the same is kind of true of AKS and GKE. So we support all those. And then we support a lot of other infrastructure providers. So if you want to do like Datadog in your, you know, AWS uh, setup, you know, today, if you're not using a tool like Pulumi, you kind of have to mash together lots of different tools to get them to work to, together. Whereas with Pulumi, you can do that all in one program. It manages the dependencies between them. Uh, and so it's, you know, one tool chain, one workflow, one approach to doing it rather than N approaches that you're gluing together with bash scripts. And this is not, when you, one thing you've also said is that this supports multiple programming languages is now, I've seen a lot of different systems say that. Is this a story where there's one blessed language that we really imagine everyone's going to be using and then a bunch of also rands? Or is there legitimate first class citizen support for a wide variety of these? Yeah, so that's actually a major focus for 2.0, actually, was making sure all of the languages are on equal footing. Um, you know, we, we launched with a very Node.js heavy um, approach, and that was, you know, Really, it took a while for us to be able to tame having multiple languages. You know, we built it, basically the core of the system is shared. So it's written in Go. And so the, the Plumi engine itself is shared between all these languages. But, you know, we had we had a fair bit of work to do to get them all at parity and make sure they have all, all, all the examples and documentation and the same features across the board. So with 2.0, we're actually happy to say they're all kind of on equal footing with each other, which is really important because I mentioned, you know, for infrastructure teams, Python is a very popular choice. For Node teams, or for developers, you know, Node tends to be a, a pretty popular choice, but each one is idiomatic in its own kind of way. Um, one of our customers, you know, uh, uses Go to embed inside of a larger system because they were already programming in Go, and they needed infrastructure as code as part of that system, and so Go is a natural choice. So each one is a little bit different. I think the other point, here that I like to make is that you get the whole tool tooling ecosystem around it. So it's not just the language. It's if you're using linters or test frameworks or package managers to share infrastructure blueprints, you can just use the ones that are native to that language, which is pretty powerful. I do notice that you hit most of the languages that people are actually going to use in the real world, except one glaring exception, my personal favorite, and that is crappy bash. Is that on your roadmap anywhere that people can now integrate Pulumi into terrible shell scripts, or is that generally not considered a best practice? You know, we've we've looked into this. Um, it's it's nothing else. I won't say never, um, but it's definitely possible. Uh, we actually have had interest in PowerShell, which is more of a object oriented scripting language, so it's a little bit more of a natural fit. Um, but but we'll see. We so almost did YAML. object oriented shell scripting. At some point, you get the distinct impression someone has lost the plot somewhere. <laughs> I uh, I used to work at Microsoft, so I'm going to have to say no comment on that one. <laughs> Understood. I will keep my nasty comments on that to myself. But mm -hmm. I tend to be more a visual person. Can you show me what this looks like here in the real world? Absolutely. So why don't I jump into some code? I'll, I'll actually show you an example that I just referenced, you know, actually setting up a virtual private cloud in Amazon and setting up public private subnets. I think it'll be fun and we'll do it in Python. Excellent. And I will exercise a skill that I need to get better at, which is shutting up. All right, let's dive in and see some infrastructure as code in action. Uh, today we're going to be using Python. I've already set up a empty project using the Pulumi new command. I'm currently in the main.py file, which is where we're going to define all the resources, although we could set up any Python project structure, but today we'll be keeping it simple. I've already imported the Pulumi namespace here, which defines the core Pulumi object model, but today we'll be doing an AWS VPC. So we'll start by importing the EC2 module from the Pulumi AWS package. We can see that all of the different services in Amazon are available here. And now to define our resources, we'll just simply start declaring objects uh, in standard Python syntax. So we'll declare our VPC here. We'll give the VPC a name. And then we'll start defining some of its 
properties. So we'll start with the Sigrid block, give it a standard range. We will enable DNS support as well as DNS host names. And this is a pretty basic, simple VPC, but we'll keep it simple. Notice that I was getting statement completion. I'm getting in interactive documentation, uh, including often links to the AWS docs themselves. If I mistype something, uh, I'm going to get an error, and it's going to tell me, you know, hey, uh, this was not the not a recognized keyword, um, and we'll offer you know suggestions for how to fix this. Um, but we've got the basic VPC here defined. Uh, and what I'll do next is export the resulting ID from the VPC. Um, exporting it just makes it easy to access. You can uh, consume this from other projects. You can um, easily script against it. It will show you, show you the output in the console. Um, but next what we'll do is we'll, we've already got a stack set up here. Uh, a stack is just an instance of my project. Right now I just have a dev stack. I can easily create you know, many different uh, stacks. Uh, each stack has its own configuration. So for this one, I'm going to set the AWS region to US West 2. Uh, and that will basically control where this stack gets deployed to. And then next, I just run the pull me up command. So pull me up is going to evaluate my project, um, figure out the resources that would be created. Uh, so in this case, it's just saying, hey, I'm going to create an Amazon VPC. All Pulumi stacks get the synthetic uh, stack object as well. And note that it's asking us if we want to do this update. We can run, this is called a preview. We can run this independently of an update if we want to serialize the output to a plan file, for example. Um, you can also select details. Notice it wasn't showing us the properties, but if we want to see the full details of this object, we can we can say details, and indeed we'll see a lot of the properties that we have set in our project show up here. Um, but for now, we're going to say yes. Go ahead and do the update, and it happened very quickly. So we've got you know uh, an update here. Um, notice that we'll see that the updates are printing a URL at the end. That's because we're using the Pulumi for state management. So if I click that link, it brings me to a page uh, that shows me all of the details of my, my um, deployments. I can see the resource here with a link to the AWS console. Um, I can see the full you know, history. There's only been one update. Uh, and then I've got organization. So if I want to look at you know, the full set of projects that I've got, um, I can go, you know, take a look at that. Um, I can elect to use offline state storage if I prefer, but this is often the easiest way to go. Uh, unfortunately, I've forgotten to tag my VPC. So let's go and see what it looks like to modify a resource. Turns out I can just go edit my project and pretend I had the tags in the first place. And I'll save my file. And then we go down and simply run Pulumi up again. And it will rerun the, pro the project. And notice that it's telling us the tags have changed. And so it's going to update the VPC in place. Um, notice it did a diff between the current state and the new desired state. I can click details to again see you know, the details. Uh, this project called Pulu 2020, get the stack name dev. So this is nice. It's automatically you know, using the, the correct tags. I can say yes. Very quickly, it will go ahead and patch the VPC by adding the tags. So that's great. Um, we've got a VPC up and running uh, with tags. I love that you did your demo that way because it is the closest thing I've seen to reality on a demo stage in years. Specifically, oh, I built this thing, but I forgot to tag it. Spoiler, no one remembers to tag things the first time. So A, thanks for building tagging support in, and B, thanks for not having the approach of, oh, you forgot to tag, tear it all down and start again, which was frustrating in almost every other system I've ever worked with. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, you know, tagging is, is super important and, and it is so easy to forget to tag your resources. And 
And so we wanted to make that easy. And it's such a basic scenario, but it's so important. Um, and so I picked that because we actually see that sort of thing in reality all the time. So this is terrific from a story of being able to build and provision infrastructure. But is that where it more or less stops? Is there something beyond that? Because the problem is, is that this almost ties into a snarky thing I saw on Twitter the other day, where since versioning is so terrible, we're going to get rid of it entirely. You've got one shot to get something out. You'd better get it right. And oh, my God, is that compelling on one hand? On the other, here in reality, it never works that way. Yeah, so that's really the theme of the 2.0 release is going beyond that basic provisioning scenario that we focused on nailing for Pulumi 1.0, which we shipped in September last year, uh, and really going beyond that to solve for some of the adjacent challenges that we're seeing with end users and customers that we're working with. And so we're calling those superpowers, which that's not just you know cheesy marketing speak that actually came from the community. We're seeing the community really saying, hey, Pulumi gives me superpowers. It allows me to do things that I couldn't do before. And so we figured, you know, have a little fun with it and, and run with that theme. And so we kind of boil those down into these five areas where and I'll walk through them just very quickly. You know, architecture, we're seeing actually a lot of folks that go beyond just the basic building blocks. I think the great thing about the cloud is you've got all of these building blocks you can assemble. I think the daunting thing is there are so many ways you can assemble them and so many ways to get it wrong. So really allowing people to use facilities of languages like abstraction and packages to reuse and share best practices, that's that's key. So architecture is one area. Uh, provisioning, kind of already covered that. That's our bread and butter. You know, we've done that from day one. We've done we've done a lot of work to improve the foundation there. Uh, a lot of performance work, getting all the languages on the same level with one another, adding more providers. We're now, you know, to the previous slide, you know, we've got over three dozen providers now. Um, testing. This has actually been a lot more popular than I expected, I'll be honest. Um, I think we gave people a language. Yeah, who's testing these days? That sounds like something people talk about but don't actually do. You're telling me you're seeing people do it for real? Yes, actually, uh, kind of surprisingly, because I, that's been my experience too. But I think you give people a programming language, you give them their favorite editor, and they kind of assume, oh, this means I can test things. And so that is a safe assumption. You can. And we've done a lot of work to help people with mocking their infrastructure during testing, and more advanced things like ephemeral environment testing and even like fuzz testing. You know, what what happens if a whole availability zone goes out? What does my application do? Or what if a whole node pool in my Kubernetes cluster dies? You know, does everything respond correctly? So we're seeing some really cool things there that end users are, are doing. Uh, next area is policy as code, which we'll show in, in just a minute. I think that's that's a really exciting feature. We've done a lot of work there with some pretty major, you know, um, customers there to make sure that governance of your infrastructure is part of how you're actually deploying and managing your infrastructure. And that can be all the way from security policies to compliance to cost management. Uh, we've got some cool demos where, you know, you can dynamically query the EC2 pricing list and use that to enforce some sort of cost policies. Uh, so that's been a big oh, focus. So you were able to implement something that interacts with that terrible API. Yes. <laughs> but the nice thing is you can do it once stick it in a package because it's a programming language and then share it. And so we're, mm. this is all open source, by the way. So we're really hoping that there's a community that, that kind of bootstraps around sharing and reusing policies, which is pretty exciting. Um, and the final area that I'll note here is delivery where, you know, we're seeing a lot of folks doing continuous delivery. You know, we have a great CLI, you can run it on your desktop, but really where a lot of folks want to end up in production is where they're doing continuous delivery both of app applications and infrastructure, it turns out these things kind of blend together. Like, especially if you're adopting containers, you're almost certainly building and publishing to a private ECR registry as part of your deployment pipeline. And that requires managing infrastructure. And then you need to go bump the ECS task references to the latest version. So we, we've done a lot of work to help and we've integrated with over a dozen different CICD uh, systems uh, to help do that. Yeah, the only thing I would want to see added to this list would be one more step, which is once I've deployed a new technology, I'd like Pulumi to automatically add it to my resume because that's the reason I make technology selection. Let's not kid ourselves. We can do that. In fact, I don't know. We might actually have a LinkedIn uh, provider at this stage. So we 
we'll that look into that. would be more than I thought LinkedIn's horrifying API would support. It seems like Microsoft bought it. They were super excited to sit on it for 15 years and do absolutely nothing with it. But I digress in a different direction there. <laughs> okay, you talk about these things being superpowers. And I'm going to treat that with the same level of suspension of disbelief that I did in middle school when a fellow sixth grader would tell me that he had superpowers. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Can you demo one of them? Of course, I'd be happy to. And or is this one of those you can fly but don't feel like it right now moments? Oh, no, no, we, we can fly. We're going we're gonna to fly. And in fact, this will tie into the last demo. So let's jump in. We're going to see how to use policy as code to make sure we don't make those same tagging mistakes over and over again. Wonderful. OK, now let's go beyond the basics. That was a pretty simple VPC example. Uh, it was nice that we could really understand what was going on, but a real VPC has a lot of different component parts to it. And so I've got this project here already that basically takes the same VPC we had just defined and augments it with some additional services. So DHCP options, an internet gateway, a route table um, for public subnets, um, a route. And then we're actually gonna basically do something that is pretty nice to be able to do this in code. We're actually gonna loop over all the availability zones and then for each one, we're going to create a public subnet and optionally private subnets uh, if it's been configured to do so uh, with a NAT gateway and, you know, pr protected NACL subnets and all these things that go into creating a proper uh, VPC. Uh, and then if we go all the way down to the bottom, we're going to see not only are we exporting the VPC ID, but we're exporting, you know, the CIDR block uh, EIPs and all the various IDs. So this is a pretty powerful capability. Notice though, it's only 200 lines of code. Uh, this is actually converted from a CloudFormation template that was literally 5,000 lines of YAML. Uh, so that's quite a big reduction. Just having four loops is, is pretty powerful. But, oh man, I forgot to tag these ones too. Uh, do I really have to go run into this every single time, forget to tag it, have to go manually update them? So we're going to see where policies code can come in, in place and, and really help us to ensure we don't make these mistakes um, going forward. But then also, uh, we'll see how to fix this in a very easy way. To keep things interesting, we're actually going to take a look at a policy written in TypeScript. It turns out you can write policy packs in any language and apply them to projects in different languages. It, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, and so policy pack is basically just, in this case, you know, an object that we define with a, an array of policies. And this one's going to be simple. We're just going to have one check. It says check that required tags are present. Uh, it turns out this is configurable. So we're going to allow the person applying this policy to define what specific tags need to be defined. This allows you to take one policy pack and apply it many times with different configuration settings. And then the meat of the check uh, here is in uh, validate resource. So what validate resource does is it gets basically uh, reads in the required tags from the configuration, checks to see if the type of the argument is a taggable resource. Uh, if it is, it's going to check to say, hey, you know, are there tags defined? Uh, and if yes, um, you know, uh, go through and make sure all the tags that are required exist. And if they don't, we're going to report a violation. So pretty basic, pretty simple project. But let's go back. All right, now that we've defined the policies, we need to apply them. Applying a policy makes sure that it gets run when I do my update. One way of applying it is to use the policy pack flag. That will allow me to run the policy pack entirely locally, pointed at any policy on, on my file system. This is a great way to test policy packs. You can use it to run policy packs, but it's easy to forget to pass that flag. And we wanna make sure that we don't forget to run the policy. So we're actually gonna publish this policy. And publishing the policy makes it available in our organization or in our account. And now I can enable that policy. And packs can be versioned, but we'll be using the, the latest. And we'll point it at the config file uh, that specifies the tags that we that we want. Now, if we go back and we try to run an update on our project, the pack will be applied. 
automatically. And what we'll see is that it will fail. It says, you know, these various resources are missing tags. And wow, there's, there's a lot of them. So that's great that we're now making sure we don't forget tags, but it's not so great that we have to go and manually fix up every single one of these instances. So let's see what we can do about that. Go back and fix up our project. It turns out, you know, we could go manually, you know, apply tags very much like we did here, um, but that would be tedious. It would take a long time. There are a lot of resources to track down. I might miss one. I might, you know, get it wrong. Uh, instead, Pulumi supports this notion of a transformation. And I've got a little code snippet here that I've already copied. So let's uh, paste that in. And what we're going to do is first, we're going to use this library um, that uh, helps us identify taggable resources. And then we're going to register a stack transformation. And this is a global transformation. You can do it on a per resource basis, but this is going to allow us to inject tags into every resource that gets allocated. So we'll define a function to, that ensures tags are present. If the type of the resource that it's seeing is taggable, it's going to initialize if the tags are empty, and then it's going to set the two required properties, you know, for the project and the stack. It's going to do this consistently across all resources in this in this stack. And in fact, now that we have this, we can go back and actually delete this, and the VPC will still get tagged appropriately. So now let's go and run Plumi up. We should see this time that there are no errors. So it's going to show us the the preview, it's gonna show us all these resources that it's gonna create. Uh, and we'll go ahead and say yes. And we are creating all the resources. Uh, it's updating the VPC in place and adding all these to it. And that's that. Uh, we know that our resources are properly tagged. We know that we're not gonna to forget to tag them in the future. And we didn't have to go manually add error prone tags everywhere else. If we wanna add a new one, like a cost center, now we've got one central place to do that uh, in the future. All right, everything's up and running. So hopefully you've seen today, you know, how you can define your infrastructure using real code, how the expressiveness of code helps us to cut down on boilerplate from basic for loops to advanced things like stack transformations. And combined with policy as code, we can make sure that we're always doing the right thing. I like the approach where you wind up now not only being able to go back and add tags retroactively, but stopping things from being deployed without those tags. That's critical because people will update things like that in a stack when they're when they're blocked from doing so early on in the process, like you folks are doing. But no one is going to remember to do these things on an ongoing basis where they have to go back and tag every resource. It just doesn't happen regardless of how well-intentioned people are. And Amazon, of course, makes this worse now with the fact that you have tag-based access control. So everyone tag everything is now a security risk for some models as well. Being able to tie this into something that is actual policy rather than just a quick stub really seems like it's the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, it's it's not easy to tag everything. You know, you've got to manually copy and paste the, that YAML all over the place or, you know, so having that capability to automatically inject the tags is just super powerful. So you can do the right thing without all the toil and without feeling like you're doing the wrong thing, because even though people do the wrong thing, it's not that they intended to, they just forget or, you know, most of the time. <laughs> and looking at what you're supporting is from throughout the entire life cycle of code. If, if I'm using platforms or languages or tooling that is not supported, I'm not saying that you're going to encompass everything, but I feel like I'd have to go significantly out of my way in order to avoid building something that is not that is not subject to Pulumi coverage. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, we're trying to you know listen to the community and cover as many of these tools as 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 make sense. And some of the you know integrations with CI/CD uh, companies, like we've got customers using each one of these, and we're happy to bring up new providers you know as needed. But we have really good coverage already. Um, and we'll continue expanding. Uh, you know, we're partners with all these folks, and so we get support and love from them as well. And so it's been it's been great. You know, we've really taken this approach of trying to integrate with the eco ecosystem rather than, you know, we, we don't we're not trying to be a CI CD vendor. We're trying to really integrate with existing folks and, and maybe take over the D part of it uh, a little bit, but you know, really integrate where people already are. Yeah, but my SourceForge hosted Perl application that is deployed with Hudson to Oracle Cloud might still have a little bit of challenge then being supported in Pulumi. But again, I feel like I have to reach to get to all four of those at the same time. Yes, and it depends. Are you using Perl 6 or? Oh, please. No one's using Perl 6. <laughs>
so I like where you're going with this, and I like the direction you're taking things in. Now, congratulations, you're taking the the wrapping paper off of 2.0 now. Terrific, great. And because as a customer, I'm never satisfied with anything, what's on the roadmap? What's next? Where is Palumi going to be headed so that when we have this conversation again, we can talk about all the things that it does then that it doesn't today? You know, we're really laying the foundation is the way that I look at it. And we've laid a really solid foundation. And there's a lot of places to go from here. You know, one that we hear all the time is really, hey, those reusable patterns that I have to discover and learn over and over and over again, you know, setting up a VPC in Amazon. Why do I have to manually set up public private subnets and NACL protected subnet? Like that feels like it should be something that's just really easy. You know, I should be able to say, hey, give me that component over there. Stand it up. Same thing with EKS. And it turns out we have some of these components, but there's so many more. Um, the cloud, especially that we're supporting multiple clouds, it's super fractal. So really helping people be successful with the cloud, I think is kind of the next major uh, step for us. And also there's a lot of automation scenarios. Like we've had people ask, hey, can I just embed Pulumi inside my existing program? Like I actually want to just build an application and our Go SDK supports this. I mentioned this kind of earlier and really looking at doing this in a first class way enables these really sophisticated automation scenarios. Like we've seen people actually dynamically doing spot price bidding and dynamically migrating workloads based on, you know, available compute and in an application aware way. So the actual application that's running on these things is aware of what's going on around it in infrastructure sense. Exactly. And so this one in particular is sort of like um, it's a it's a data pipeline written in Python that is just constantly scaling up and down based on the the amount of load on the system. And as it does that, it's trying to optimize pricing so that its placement is as optimal as possible. Um, that's just one example. It's sort of like self-managing infrastructure that's enabled by this, this sort of a platform. And so I'm excited about a lot of those uh, scenarios as well. But really, you know, just want to make people more successful in the cloud. And again, that that's easier said than done. Um, but I think we've got a pretty solid foundation to start from. So if I want to get started, how do I do that? When what does that process look like? Yeah, so Pulumi is open source. Um, so you get started by going to Pulumi.com. Um, Pulumi.com slash start if you want to go specifically to the page to get started on. Um, and that'll walk you through downloading the tool. Uh, it's it's really easy. You can download it in Brew or Chocolate if you're on Windows or curling an endpoint on Linux. Um, install the SDK. That's, that's all open source. The SDK is all open source. Um, we offer a free backend so that when you're doing deployments, you don't have to think about state. We really wanted it to operate more like, you know, a managed AWS service or, you know, then then sort of an with a way tool. better name. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, I guess one question I have about getting started is I've heard a lot of stories around different tooling where you go ahead and get started and it's super easy and all the demos are pure greenfield. But I would argue that virtually no one is building anything today in a pure greenfield way, because the first time we try something with an AWS account, we click around in the console. Every environment is going to have stuff already pre-existing. No one builds infrastructure as code until way after they really should have been using infrastructure as code. How what is the adoption story for existing applications who want to start embracing what Pulumi can do? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. In fact, as part of 2.0, uh, we've actually done a lot of work to, to address that question. In fact, on our docs website, we have a section called Adopting Pulumi that kind of walks you through what to do, whether you pointed and clicked, or maybe you started with a different IAC tool or, you know, so so really we have three solutions. One, you can coexist. So if you don't want to move everything today, you can coexist with existing infrastructure. The second is you can import. So you can actually import existing infrastructure and that like slurps up the metadata that you already have. So if you pointed and clicked, you just say, hey, take that EC2 VM and, you know, pull it into my program. Uh, and the third is conversion tooling. So we actually have tools that will convert existing IAC, uh, you know, like HCL, for example, to Pulumi as a target. Uh, so that not only retains the infrastructure, so it doesn't perturb the existing infrastructure, but it also keeps your source structure in place, which that second step, if you just point us in an account, we don't know what the original program structure was. So that third option, if you want to maintain your existing source layout is a is a good option for you. But we know very few people are coming Greenfield. And so we've done a lot of work to help people migrate real real projects at scale. Right. Legacy code is anything that's working. Yes. And if it's working, it's great. I mean, no, no judgment here. Excellent. 
So if people want to figure out more about what you're doing, join the community, be a part of the conversation, where can they go? Yeah, so, you know, we're all on GitHub. So ultimately, you know, if you if you want to interact on sort of like pull request welcome, you know, we're always, you know, open with the community. We do open planning. We we definitely share with the community um, a lot. We have a community Slack and it's got several thousand people, actually, believe it or not, there. We've got channels for AWS, GCP, Azure, Kubernetes. We've got the whole team hangs out there. So that's the best place to go. You go to slack.palumi.com. Uh, if you go to slack.palumi.com, um, you can sign up. Everybody's welcome. And talk to the team, talk to the community, and definitely eager to help out there. And then you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, we're very active on Twitter as well. Yes, in a more constructive way than I tend to be active on Twitter. Well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate your taking the time to explain this stuff to me. It's always challenging to figure out what the what the best way to get started with something new is, especially since once you learn something new once, the first time, why would anyone ever go back and learn a second way of doing something? Because once you know something, you're set. You can stop learning that thing. Yes. Well, no, I, I really appreciated the time today and um, definitely check it out. Let us know what you think. I think uh, 2.0 is a super exciting release. I think, you know, even if you, you've checked it out before, you should check it out again. Uh, we've we've come a long way and definitely welcome anybody new to the community. Great. Thanks again. Thanks, Corey. Thanks for joining us. To learn more, go to palumi.com slash start.